and we might get started. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us in this workshop today. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Mark Olson to you, who's going to be the facilitator for the session. So we're going to learn about learning from normal work in incident investigations today. I've had the pleasure of working with Mark in Southpac in a uh, hop capacity as a hop coach. And uh, he's certainly got a wealth of experience in coaching and facilitation and incident investigation, risk management, auditing, all things safety. So he's been uh, in the federal police in a past life, um, which has really helped him direct and, and pivot into this safety space with a wealth of experience in investigations. So he's going to take us through some blue line um, investigation methodology, which is what we'll learn about today. Um, it is a little bit of a different session with workshop online. So we're going to be giving group work a go a little bit later in the session and we'll talk you through what that looks like. But never fear, hopefully, fingers crossed, all the IT and admin work will work seamlessly. And all we ask of you is that you participate and where possible, keep your cameras on for that group work and throughout. Feel free to make use of the chat box um, with any questions or um, anything relevant that you want to discuss and I'll feed that through with, with Mark as we go and we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. So with that, I won't waste any more time and I'll hand over to you, Mark. Great, thanks. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, joining in today. There's a few, few familiar faces I see there. Um, a few familiar names, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, so as, as Vanessa said, feel free to um, have a look at the, you know, uh, just put a chat message in through to Vanessa if you've got a question at any stage and we'll try and fit it in during the session. Uh, we will have a, a, a Q&A uh, at the end of, of the session today as well. So um, let's sort of, let's get into it. So I'm not sure if anyone saw this story in the news recently, but I thought it was really interesting. Um, so I, one of my clients is a utilities company and uh, they deal with this, this sort of situation. So the, the cover photo you see there is um, of uh, what they call a fatberg, um, which is a really interesting thing. So this is a, a waste treatment plant for, for sewage water and that is all the stuff that's been thrown down the toilet that shouldn't have been thrown down the toilet. Um, so um, yeah, so which is interesting. So they have to get that out because it won't, it won't break down. So with, with COVID-19 happening and there's shortage of uh, toilet paper or the or, or what was going on there, they found uh, a lot of stuff getting down there. So this is normal work for these people. Um, so imagine that's your day. So that's been sitting through sewage pipes and they have to pull this out. Um, now it's a little bit more than, they're getting a lot more of it at the moment than they normally deal with. So their normal work's changing um, and, and, and may go back to normal. But so uh, if you think you're having a rough day, Think of what these poor people have to do. So uh, I just want to, we're going to talk a little bit more, more about that later on. So I'll just, yeah, let's talk about work. So for those that don't know about the black line, blue line, I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of it. And it sort of comes from work from uh, Todd Conklin. And basically we talk about the black line being the work. So if you imagine from left to right, um, it's the start of a job. That's the task. We call the black line workers intended. Well, that's what I call it. Todd calls it workers imagined. I, I think we've, we're a little bit more planned with our work than it just to be imagined. I think we, we plan our work generally in organisations. So it's our workers intended. That's our procedures, our policies, our SWMSs or JHAs or whatever you want to call them. That's, that's our work as intended, the black line. But then we have a difference. Um, now, everyone here would know, and um, I'm sure, that work doesn't get done as our procedures are done, does it? So we call that the blue line. Now, that's how work normally gets done. That's the work, that's the everyday, day-to-day -day work that the workers do. And sometimes it exceeds our expectations, sometimes it doesn't. And there's lots of things that impact on that. And we call that the blue line. And 
a quick question. Uh, does anyone there, and, I'll, I'll, and if you do, please put up your hand uh, and let Vanessa know. Does anyone there think all of their procedures are 100% complete and 100% correct? Anyone? Raise your hand like you can raise your hand in the, in the thing, eh? We have the toilet. Don't forget to put yourself on mute, by the way, at the moment. I'd say so, no. <laughs> so I don't think anyone put their hand up, did they, Vanessa? No, we had no hands up, but we got a few no's and shakes of heads. So. Yeah, exactly. So we know they're not right. So people do act outside our procedures and our policies, right? But there's not just because they're not complete or not correct. There's a whole host of other reasons why they do it. And those are things like production pressure, you know, there's flawed processes we've talked about. There's change in plans, trade-offs. You know, what's the biggest trade-off we have? Safety versus efficiency. You know, that's the biggest, one of the biggest trade-offs we have. There's surprises. Um, you know, there's other experience that they have, resource tr resources, constraints. All these things impact whether or not a task is completed how we think it might be tasked and how they complete a task. And they exist all the time. This exists constantly. And it's normally not a problem. In fact, if we were to go and have a look at our, our um, and, I, and, and I apologize from the start because I hate referring to any sort of frequency metric in injuries. But if you were to look at your frequency metrics and anyone that sits around that 10, 12 sort of mark, if you do the math, and you worked out and you allocated maybe an hour per um, recordable injury, um, of all the hours you, you work, you probably find that 99.9% .9 of the time you're working safely, right? That these things don't, that people aren't getting hurt, but all those conditions still exist, right? We still have resource constraints. Whereas if someone doesn't turn up to work, we don't have the right tools or equipment, you know, we still have trade-offs. We still have surprises. We have variability. We have weather. All these things are constantly there that we occur, but 99.9% .9 of the time, things are fine, right? And we don't look at that 99.9. That .9. We only look at it when things go wrong. So, well, that's what we that's when we want to learn about normal work because well again we have the black line again our intended our blue line we have our 99.9% .9 of the time we're all good and then occasionally that 0.1% and don't hold me to that math right it's rough math okay um it's rough math um it's when we intersect with a hazard or we drift into failure as some, as some uh, academics write it and we hit a hazard. That's when we suddenly want to learn about what happened, but we forget about the blue line and all we want to do is compare it to the black line, which doesn't really make sense to me because if we really want to know where the systemic issues are, they're the, they're the issues that are occurring all the time, regardless of whether or not we have an incident or not. An incident is just a trigger. So, they all exist. We really want to know what is going on in here, right? All those, all these conditions, the context of the work, that's what we really want to know. So if we look at three parts of, uh, of every failure, and this is from Todd Conklin. Sorry, I should have referenced him on this slide. I haven't, um, but it's from Todd's book. So he, he says there's three parts to every failure. There's the context, the consequence and the retrospective understanding. Um, can I get a show of hands about who thinks that the the retros the consequence is the most important thing? Are we able to do that? To see, I think you got a you got a raise your hand button on your on yep, your thing. You'll find it in reactions in the bottom taskbar, or just simply yep. You can always use the chat as well. Yep. Yeah, we've got some thumbs up happening here. So, so, that, so what do we say? That this is the, you think the consequence is the most important thing. That's what, that's what we've just said. <laughs> A few thumbs yeah. down I thought you asked, was it the context? So, so that, was the, was that was from Phil, was it? Yeah. 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 Well, I suggested so, it. Yeah. So 
the other two parts, the consequence to me is probably the least interesting thing. There's nothing I can do about that. That's already occurred. But if I want to learn the other two choices I have, so the retrospective understanding, sorry, I'll just go back a slide. Sorry. Mm. The retrospective understanding is the what if, you know, the why, 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 our typical root cause analysis um, that we, a lot of organisations employ. The context is more about the understanding the, the understanding, the context of an event, all those messy issues, the messy story that exists around an event, that exists around the work. Mm -hmm. Whereas the retrospective understanding is like it's 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 after the event, and we're going and we're and we're more looking at the what if or the why's and the contextual understanding. Anything to add to that, Vanessa? Well, we just had a bit of a, a yes and no to that uh, in the chat. On consequence. Yep. So Grant, um, Grant, did you want to elaborate on that one? Yeah, I'm just, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. I'm just saying, and just sometimes from my previous roles of investigation, sometimes the consequence we have found other actions that we hadn't thought of or needed to look at just from that consequence. So I agree mostly what you're saying there, Mark, but just sometimes we did find other things that weren't expected by that consequence. Yeah, no, that, that, that probably can, sometimes a consequence can um, allow you, like, to, the measure of the impact you weren't expecting, perhaps, uh, yeah. or some of your mitigating control. So I'm not saying it's not interesting. Yeah, I'm 90% with you. I'm 90% with you, just 10% on the other yeah. part. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's actually, it's, it's quite surprising. I can't remember who, who I was talking to about it, but um, I think it might have been Drew Ray mentioned it. So when we, when we look at, if we consider investigation as a, as a scientific process, and what scientists do, typical root cause methodologies tell you to remove the context and just focus on this straight line, this, this why, 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 or in this case, uh, the way Todd's um, displayed it is, is horizontally, why, why, why. Every other scientific methodology that you could care to look at says you've got to take into account the context. And that's where the messy story is. That's where all those influences fit. The good thing about a retrospective understanding, it's nice and neat. Unfortunately, work is not nice and neat it's complex so excellent thanks grant and phil right so let's talk about what is work as normal so it's it is the messy story it actually is the task or the work so quite often when we investigate an event people are looking at um they just focus solely on the on the event itself rather than focusing on the work when we, when we talk about focusing on work as normal, we want you to focus on the task, the job they are doing, and actually the day-to-day -to, -day to it, and not just that specific day or that specific moment in time where that event might have occurred, but in the general, the, the, every day how it gets done, and finding out when things go well or they don't go well, you know, how workers compete, you know, how, how they cope with variability. Like if, if someone doesn't turn up, how do they deal with that? If they don't have the right tool, how do they deal with that? You know, um, how, when, when, you know, when things go according to plan and the opposite, when, what happens when it doesn't go to plan? What happens when, when, you know, things break down? Like well, that's one of our most common uh, events happen around breakdowns of equipment. You know, like how many of you have investigated incidents with a isolation procedure break? You know, that's, that's that one off that happens. How do they cope with that? How do they find it? You know, what's hard of the task? What's easy part of the task? What are their challenges, their successes, right? It's not about the policies or the procedures. Right? When we're focusing on the work as normal, we're focusing on the blue line only. We're not worried about whether they've got a license or don't have a license. That's a different stream of work to look at. We're not worried about whether they have their permits. We're not worried about those things. We're just focused on the actual hands-on what they're doing you know if they're digging a hole in this case you see the photo they're drilling a hole they're, actually they're putting some casing in um that was an interesting day um but yeah it's it's all about the work itself you know in this case there that photo there they were putting casing in and they didn't quite have the right equipment and uh we ended up stopping that job because um it, it just got too too dangerous um so, you know, they, but they had to vary, they had to vary how they normally do that task because they didn't have it. 
And, 90, and, and every other time, most of the times when they do that task, it's fairly straightforward. So that's what we're talking about. Work as normal is how the workers actually do their work. Now, when I say workers, and I think um, I did hear someone say this at a, at a workshop, I think with Eric and Nagel, everyone is a worker, right? So this, not, this just doesn't apply to workers in the field like we see here. It actually applies to workers in the office as well. They have a blue, they have a pointy end as well. Um, so it, you can use this, this, this uh, methodology or this thought process with people that um, have administrative tasks as well. It's not just about people with hands on. So, but the, the counter to that is you can't just collect it in a room. Well, you can, but your best results are to get out in the field and talk to people. You need to get out there. And that's where some people struggle. So one of the things we wanted to talk about today was generative questions. And what is a generative question? Has anyone got a suggestion what a generative question might be? A definition for that, anyone? Feel free, speak up. Use the chat box if you need. Provide an answer to uh, what you're trying to investigate. Yeah. Yep. We've got generates discussion. Um, no a yes or no answer. Not a yes or no answer. Yep. Ask people how they do their work. Questions on how, what, why things are done. Um, generates discussion around a topic. Open-ended questions. Yes. Really good. Great. Uh, oh, someone's got a good question. Someone's got a good generative yep. question there. Yeah. Well done, Michael. Yeah. So, okay, so we're jumping here. We're getting some good, good questions. So hold on to those, and and they're all good points. So generative questions are questions that you ask in wonderment and curiosity, and when you're seeking ideas for creating change and asking them to be shown what else is possible. So I want you to reflect on that a little bit, and like. This is a real like turnaround for me. So as Vanessa alluded to, I was a, I was a federal agent back in the day, um, and we didn't use terms like wonderment and curiosity. Um, it's a it's it, it's it's a quite a soft skill that I've had to learn, and, and especially the last few years. And um, and and but this is this is where this is where trust comes in. This is where being genuine comes in. So if you're genuinely curious, people see that, right? People, people, people sense when you're genuinely curious. They also sense when you're just asking a question because they think that you think you have to ask it and you're not listening. So we, we want to be genuine, genuinely curious. No one knows how to do that work better than they do. So who better to teach you that? No one knows better the context of their work, the challenges of their work better than they do. So who better to teach you that? So it's that genuine curiosity, right? And then it goes, goes a little bit further, seeking ideas for creating change, right? Asking to show them what else is possible. So this, this way of, this methodology of, of, of part of your investigation process is sort of changing the point of an investigation from strictly, we must prevent reoccurrence of this event ever happening again. And I'll throw out a bone here and feel free to attack it maybe later on. Because um, I used to teach this and I was having a discussion with Dave Whitefield yesterday. I used to teach people that the reason we investigate incidents prevent recurrence. That was it. That was, I used to have, I used to write it in presentations that I would deliver and training I would deliver to people on investigating incidents. Now, I believe that we investigate in incidents or events as I prefer to call them so we can learn about the work and improve the work to reduce the likelihood of an incident occurring. Because if there's one thing I've seen, I've never seen an organization yet, unless it eliminates the task or the, the hazard completely, that has yet to prevent a recurrence of a serious potential incident. Um, because it's, unless you eliminate it, I don't see how you can do it. So anyway, let's keep going. I, I, I digress. So we're looking for create ideas that create change from the people that's there. What else is possible? You know, procedures written in a room by head office are restricted in the knowledge of their work. So we want to know what's going on. Right? We're looking for questions without bias, per judgment, preconceived conclusions from a fixed point of view, 
oh, this is good or bad or and, and to create a safe life, uh, environment for learning. Who here thinks they can ask, do an investigation, put your hand up without bias? Does anyone in online at the moment think they can show, they can actually have an, uh, have an investigation uh, and be a uh, facilitated investigation um, completely without bias? We're getting a few shaking heads. No's. Yep, so we've got a, we've got a couple, have we? Uh, yeah. Um, Saudi, um, I'm just going to unmute you. Do you have a question? Hang on. Uh, you're, not, you're not unmuted, Saudi. You're not unmuted. Sorry. No, Hang I don't on. have a question. But however, I wanted to say that it is possible to be relatively uh, bias free. That is, uh, that's provided set up from the beginning. I'm, I'm well aware of the risk of bias and confirmation of bias that you might take in with you as a baggage as you go into the investigation. But it can be, it is difficult, but it can be done um, within maybe 80 20 or 90 10 um, ratio or so. Yep. Oh, uh, thanks, Saudi. I appreciate your feedback there. Um, oh, people a lot smarter than me have written whole papers and PhDs on, on, on bias and things like that. I, my personal belief is um, we all have some bias because we all have experience that we bring to any, any, any job that we do. Um, to, you can't wipe that out. Um, but you need to acknowledge your bias and make sure that you, um, yeah, and you, and you make sure you confirm that you're not pursuing a, a direction or a way of talking to people um, that, that uh, is clouded by bias. So the, the big thing is, is without judgment. So that's part of our hop um, sort of our hop principles is, is judgment because judgment's a form of blame. So one of the hardest things you have to do when you're going to the field and asking general questions is not react. So when someone tells you something, that you don't like hearing, the worst thing you can do is blow up about it. You lose their trust straight away um, and they won't want to see you anymore and you won't learn those, those things that are really good. So it's really good to try and, you know, we don't want it, we don't know. All we want to do is learn. We're going into the field of learning. So, and our last point here is they elicit a messy story of how work actually goes, right? There's a generative questions designed to get people to talk to you. So those things before people mentioned about open, open, open-ended questions. Yeah, that's one way. That's one way of getting those. So one of the things. This is a quote from Andrea Baker, um, and and I've known this. I've done this myself in the past, and and I acknowledge it now. It was part of my bias. How I viewed the operator. How we viewed the operator. I viewed how, the questions we asked them. So if we think if we're viewing the operator as incompetent or blaming them, we're going to ask questions all about the operator. Now, if I only ask questions about the operator, all I'm going to get is information about the operator, which means my solutions will only all be about the operator. Now, if I restrict myself just in that space, because that's what I've concentrated on, the only solutions I'm going to get won't be this, will affect the probability of people getting hurt. So we have to talk about the work and not view the operator as incompetent or to blame. It's that open, it's that no judgment. And that's the challenge. That's the challenge. So we talk about shifting your thinking from who failed to what failed. You know, with systems thinking, what's the systems that are driving certain behaviors or culture? What's the system that's driving that? So learning about the work. So these are some of the questions here. Now, these are not an exhaustive list. Like I think we've got a, I think we've, with South Park, we've got about five pages of generative type questions, right? These are some of the ones I like to ask. Um, I think Vanessa, we're recording this and we're going to be putting this up for people to grab later on as well. Yep. Yeah, and so, we'll get a, a link to the recording. Yep. Yep. Tell me about the task, walk me through it. Tell me about your experiences with this task. So, you know, when's it gone well? When's it gone bad? Tell me about, you know, all those sorts of things. I like this one. How far back do I need to go to understand it? Right? Like, so where's my starting point? Like, what do I need to know? Like, do I have to go back to purchasing? Do I have to go back to planning? Where do I need to go to understand it? You know, as I said, what's a good day look like? Are the rules practical? Like, can you follow them? You know? 
Do we ever ask that question? Where is it easy to make a mistake? That's what I like that one too. Where can someone stuff up? If you had a new person, if your daughter or son was coming in to work with you, what, what's the one thing you'd want to make sure they knew was that they had covered off? What near misses have we had? So this is a question that gets asked all the time. A lot of organisations believe they have a really good reporting culture. But actually when they're surveyed, their workers are surveyed, um, pretty much at minimum 30% um, of their workers, and this is from, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the company. Um, they, did this with all their, they did this survey with all their people. Um, reported an unreported near miss or injury but every single organization thought they had a good reporting culture. So when you ask, oh, has this nearly gone wrong? Has someone nearly got hurt? You'll be surprised. And again, don't react. You know, when you ask that sort of question and you hear about when someone nearly got their leg taken off, don't go, oh, why wasn't it reported? Tell me more about that. What happened? Find out, get details. If you overreact, then you're going to find that they won't, just won't tell you about it. You know, any ideas how we can fix it? So some of those that are used to learning teams, uh, this might be a struggle because we're asking, oh, what can we fix it? Because sometimes, you know, if we ask those improvement questions, or oh, how could we make this task better? How can we do things better? We learn what some of the issues are as well, if we didn't have an ask. And we also might learn some great fixes from the people doing the work, which probably that's all they do. That's probably all they think of. You know, when have you had to adapt how you do the job? That adaptability. What's the worst thing that could happen? Um, some control stuff. When does the control not work well? When's not, you know, when's isolation, when does that not work? You know, when, when's that not working well when it's not? How do we fail safely? You know, when's the control work? When's isolation save someone from, from getting zapped or getting hurt? Great question. How are we effectively safe, safely failing? Those of you that know the HOP principles understand one of our, one of our ones is people make mistakes um, or errors normal along those lines. If we understand that, then we know at some stage we're going to fail. So therefore, how can we fail safely? Does that control work? It's fantastic. Right, just a little bit of humor there from peanuts. Yes, no, I didn't get copyright privileges. So please don't <laughs> Just between you and I, just between you and my closest 60 odd friends. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think we can all, uh, all agree with that. Right. So this is my favorite. These are my favorite four words. Tell me a story. So if you're struggling with a question in the field, someone brings something up, tell me a story about how, when this went, why? Tell me a story. Stories are fantastic. Stories paint pictures. Stories give details. You know, how often have you walked into the field and someone said, oh, it's all crap. Oh, the process is shit. That's fascinating. Doesn't tell me anything. I haven't learned anything. And I can't help you if I don't learn. I can only help you if I learn what's actually specifically wrong. So telling me a story, giving me details. The other one, the other three words I love are tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more about that. So someone says about a near miss. Oh, you know, someone only got hit by a forklift. Oh, wow. Oh, that's, that's, are they okay? Yep. No, no, they're okay. Well, tell me more about that. How did that happen? What happened there? Tell me more. So those two sentences are my favorite questions to ask. And if you ever get stuck, tell me a story. Tell me a story. It works really well. So, got a good one there. He says, he asks, um, just help me understand. So what was that? Grant has another good one. He yep. asks, yep. help me understand. Yeah, help me understand. Yep. Because if you go in there as the person that doesn't know anything, so to, quite often, especially in um, behavioural-based safety, and that's, a, that's another webinar altogether, um, typically it's the, it's the poo sandwich, you know, and it's the leader comes in, tells people, oh, look, it's fantastic. Um, fantastic, you're wearing your gloves and your PPE but this is how you should be doing this job better. The, this is the reverse side of this. This is you going in and asking, how can I do my job better to help you? So it's a need that I need to understand. So that's, that's really good. I love it. So if I was to go into this, into this work area here with um, the fatberg, then pulling out the fatberg. So 
the first thing I'd be going is saying, oh, guys, tell us what's going on here. You know, okay, oh, tell me more about this. Tell, tell me more about how you do this job. Walk me through it. Okay, when does it go, you know, what are the issues you have when you're doing this job? When does it go well? You know, how are your resources for this? You know, are there other ways we could do this better? Um, you know, have we had any issues with this task? Like, you know, we had any people nearly get hurt by the fatberg. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd hate to get hit by that thing. Um, you know, it's going to be horrendous. So I want to ask those sort of, tell me a story about the worst one you've had to deal with. You know, what's, tell me, tell me the story about the big one that you had. Tell me a story about when, it, you know, what, what's, tell me, tell me about when it's, when you don't get these, what's going right. Or tell me when, when, when they're all little and manageable and you don't need, what's that, five people to do it. And we've got one guy, two people in working at Heights Gear. Um, so I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's for confined spaces, maybe for confined spaces, but tell me about that. So they're the sort of questions I want to know. I want to understand, you know, when's it go well? When's this job really hard? Like what makes this job more difficult for you? So those are the sort of questions I want to ask there. So we're going to split up in a second. So Vanessa um, is going to split you up into some groups. Mm -hmm. And hopefully if it works, this is, this is technology. This is the scary bit, everyone. So we're going we're gonna to put you into a group. So what, what we want you to do is when you get into groups, put your cameras on, um, uh, unmute yourselves, mm -hmm. uh, a point, a sp so some, one person straight away. We're, not, we're only allocating about 10 minutes for this, maybe a little less because time is I'm speaking too much. Um, so actually, we've got, okay for time. So we want you to appoint someone as a, as a spokesperson. So just one person be responsible for taking some notes. Um, we want you to quickly go around your group. I think we've got about 60 people, have we? Um, just under. So we'll probably split up into, into five, five groups. Um, Vanessa, if, that's, if that works for you. How about six? Okay, six groups apparently. And we're going about 10 people per okay. group. Okay, perfect. So we'll split up into six groups. Um, yeah. And we want you to, to, as it says on the screen, just quickly go around the room and say who you are, where you work for, where you live. Like keep it short and sweet. And then I'm going to play a video in a minute. So sorry, this is the next part of the, I, did, I should have said I'm going to play a video. I'm going to play a little video of, a, of an incident. Don't worry, it's a forklift incident. No one gets hurt. So it's all cool. In fact, it's a little bit humorous. Um, I, want to not, I want you to think about the incident itself. Nominate a minimum of three people or roles of who you would want to talk to to learn about normal work as a group. Come up with a couple of questions for each of them. So come up with one or two questions for each of those people. And then from your questions, where do you hope you might learn some system issues? Right? Some, some, some issues that the, that the, that, um, the organisation would be responsible for or, or systemic issues that the organisation could possibly be dealing with. I know it's a bit, of a, a bit of a leap and I'm asking you to make some assumptions, but that's part of what we're going to do. So, um, and thanks for those people that have had to, to, to log off or they've already logged off, but anyway. Um, so let's, let's get into that. Um, so Just a note on that, Mark. I, I know that some of you don't have video, so that's okay. If you can unmute yourself. Um, that would be great. Or there's a chat function that you can use as well. So we're going to play the video. And then um, after the video, that's when Vanessa's going to put you into the, into the groups. And then we're going to come back and the spokesperson from each group is just going to provide some feedback to everyone else um, about uh, some, uh, what they've seen and, and that sort of stuff. Okay, so here's the video. So apologies if it's a little bit choppy, but we are going bandwidth wise. Mm -hmm. Gosh. So I'll play that again, just so everyone can get a, a clear scope of who's around. Oh, 
There we go. So, um, everyone clear with what they've got to do? So, some people in roles that you want to talk to. Appoint a spokesperson first, sorry. Um, introduce yourselves. People you want to talk to. Um, I'll just go back on that. People you want to talk to, like three people, just, just P3 people you'd want to talk to or roles. What questions you would ask each of them? Only a couple. And from your questions, what issues you would want to learn. So I'm expecting, I'm going to allocate 10 minutes for this, so maybe a couple of minutes for the start, introduction, and then two or three minutes each for those. So if the people that are um, looking after each group can just keep an eye on that time. And then Vanessa and I hope we'll be able to duck into each of the... Um, each of the rooms and have a little listen. Okay, yeah. over to you, Vanessa. I'll stop sharing. Wonderful, thank you. So um, you'll all move automatically into your groups. If you're having any troubles, there is an option to raise your hand, and that we we can jump in and um, help you from there. It'll give you a timer um, when the ten minutes is up, and it will automatically bring bring you back to the group. So if you want to finish before that, and you've you've not had to need the 10 minutes, that's fine. You can exit that um, breakout room as well at any time. All right, so I'm gonna send you all in your groups. There's five groups. And if you can make sure you're unmuted, that'd be great. Here we go. Excellent. Oh, I like ben, Benjamin Elliott, nice backdrop. Beautiful, very serene. All right, Mark, I'll share the whiteboard. How's that sound? That sounds excellent. So what we'd like to do is uh, we're going to, to make some notes and obviously uh, Vanessa's recording this. We're going to use a facility called a whiteboard. Amazing. Uh, so can I just start with, um, with, the groups, uh, with one of the groups and I just want you to, to tell me the first the one person you want to talk to, one question you ask and one thing you might learn if you got a chance to get around to that in your conversations. So volunteer one, please, from, from the, one of the groups. Uh, truck driver. Can I go first? Oh, yep. Who have we got? Hi everyone. Shishank here from yep. Woodside. I think uh, we would like to speak to the forklift driver. Yep. And yeah. the question I would ask is, what are the safety barriers in place that day before he went to the job, went to end up at his job? Safety barriers, is it, or values? Barriers. Barriers. Right. My bad. How's that sound? Yep. And what might you learn from that? I think in the video, it was clear that uh, there was no safety whiz worn or nothing like that. So, okay. Yep. Just to understand what precautions were taken before you, they planned because there was a stack of uh, pallets in, in the road. Yep. Okay. And through that, the whole story, hopefully. Okay. On what went wrong. Cool. Thank, thanks, thanks, Shashank. Okay, next group. I'll go, Stacey. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Stacey. <laughs> hey, how are you going? Good. Um, we'll go, because they're already up there, we'll go the supervisor. Yep. Um, and the question we'd like to ask is, how is this job done normally? Yep. Um, and we, what we'd want to learn is, obviously, that, the answer to that question and then that would guide us um uh, the the differences that had been conducted in this task um and that would lead us into further questions for the people the setup and what we can learn how if it was done differently okay excellent excellent thank you very much all right no, next question. next yeah yep. so I did mention the truck driver, so if I finish, maybe that, the questions and what we'd learn, maybe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, um, it's all right. Um, so we said, walk, can you walk us through a normal delivery process? Ah, uh, good question. And then learning for that, because it appeared to be on the side of a road. So, um, you know, the structure maybe of the premises, has anything changed? Um, is it a contractor? Are they an employee delivery? Those kind of things. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Stacey. Well done. Right. Um, I think we have any groups that we have, Vanessa? We've had three so far, so there should be a couple uh, more. Should I can more. jump in here if you like. 
Thank you. Um, we who, have we, who, who have we got? Sorry? David from Perth. G'day, David. Hey, g'day, mate. Um, seeing as our options were already taken, we had loader of the truck. So whoever, whoever was responsible for loading the truck. Okay, yeah, cool. It's a bit of chain of responsibility stuff there. Yeah, yeah, they didn't look as though it was loaded uh, that safely, otherwise he would have been able to get his tines all the way in. Um, a couple of our questions have already been put up there, but we're okay. pretty keen on, you know, how is the job normally done? Um, for tell us a story of the day. Um, oh. Some of the things which we thought might we might learn from that would be failure in communication, which, you know, issues. Okay, yeah. So if it wasn't loaded, if it wasn't loaded properly, why was that not communicated down the line? Excellent, excellent. Right, um, last group. Anyone else? It's going to be have to be us, Tony, Anna. Yeah, think. probably. It's going to be have to oh. be us. Who did, did, did nominated you two? <laughs> or we should nominate Justin from Urban Utilities to come in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Let's go. Yeah. So, like, we were the sort of the same truck driver, forklift driver, warehouse operator. That's who we were sort of thinking. Yep. Yeah. And maybe, and who loaded the vehicle in the first place? Yeah. Yep. Nice. And what questions would you ask? We were sort of, I was curious around those pallets. So, I'd have been asking the question, you know, how does this normally go? You know, what, what's, Tell me about those pallets. What are they there for? What do about this, about this job? Yep. And what did you learn from that? Oh, things, things that get in the way. So things that are uh, challenging for that particular person in getting the job done. Um, you can learn a little bit about the constraints and any goal conflicts they might have that they're put under pressure with. Yep. Excellent. Uh, is there any other group out there or was, was it just the five? I made it five. I narrowed it down for you now, Mark. Oh, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. And firstly, I want to thank everyone for participating. Um, and I also want to thank um, uh, the people that uh, volunteered. I know the group first group I popped into uh, with Stacey there. Stacey made the mistake of speaking first and therefore got nominated to be the spokesperson. So uh, thank you to all those people that, uh, that were brave enough to, to, to talk and, and, and do that. So I appreciate that. Um, so I just want to make a, I just want to ask a quick question. How many of you focused on the incident and not the task? Feel free to raise your hand or yell out or unmute. Yeah, or... we did as a whole group, group three, and then we went, oops, we've, uh, yeah, our boss jumped out straight away. We went straight to focusing on the incident. Yeah, it's a trap, isn't it? It's one of the biggest traps we find. So I did manage to pop into two or three groups, and one of the questions I said to them was, um, imagine if that task had gone right. So imagine if there hadn't have been the incident. Imagine if they hadn't have lost the load. Would you be asking the same questions? Would there be the same issue? You know, we want to focus on the task. So can someone tell me what the task was? Unloading a pallet from a truck. Unloading a pallet from a truck. Awesome. That's what the task was. So if we were to go into that task, we'd want to ask them, how do you normally unload a truck? You know, where do you normally go? Like, what's, how does it normally work? Um, and it, it was pointed out, sometimes they, like, maybe it was a one-off that they had to unload from the road because it was a public road they were unloading from. So maybe it was a one-off and they weren't prepared for it. Maybe there was something different. But what are the other things? If we just focus on the incident, we might only focus on the one issue surrounding that particular event rather than all these other issues they may have around scheduling, loading of trucks and all sorts of things that might also exist outside of that one incident. Does that make sense? I hope so. So let's remember that the key point here is don't, when you go into the field and you're asking about an event, foc on, and, and you're going to focus on the task, not the event. Where are you going to learn, where, how are you going to find out about the event? From the people there? Yeah, and what do they normally do? Like an event happens, what normally happens? What's the supervisor normally want or get? They get super defensive. 
Blame. No, no, Blame so that, games, yeah. No, 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 I'll get a statement. I'll get a statement, an incident report or something like that. So you're, there might even be some video if it just happens to be someone videoing it. And the other point I want to ask is, and I know in one of the groups um, I popped in, they said they want to talk to, I think it might have been Thomas mentioned it, he just doesn't want to talk to the one forklift driver. Who would you want to talk to? Cool. As many as you can. As many, you, you don't just talk to one supervisor, talk to all of them. Don't just talk to one tractor, talk to all of them. And when I say all of them, it's, all, it's comparative, you know, with the size, of the, the size of the issue. But you want to talk to as many as you can because what if it's just one person that does something completely differently to someone else? That might be work as normal for them, but it's not work as normal for the organisation. So it might be a different suite of issues that we have on that crew or with that supervision or that organisational system. It might be night shift. Who's heard, a thing, who's heard of the story? Oh, let's do it on night shift. Why do we do it on night shift? No, no, super because we get all rain. we've done that you can't Free do it on day shift. And I've done that too. <laughs> we do it on night shift because there's no management around to tell us we're doing it wrong. <laughs> Right, and we get stuff done, right? So we want to know about that. So that's really important. Okay, thanks for that. that that'll wrap that little exercise up. We'll go through and, and, and try and knock you off as quick as we can because um, I know we're running very close to the end of time. So if you can put us back um, out of there and I will share my screen again. Yeah, so I'm aware of time, guys. I know that um, we said to one, it would be great if you could stay on. Mark's just got a few more um, points to drive at home, um, but you will get this recording afterwards as well. Right, so just a couple of things. Yeah. They're conversations, generative questions, are best com ones of conversations. You don't just need to be in the, there's other ways of getting some of that work as normal. So learning teams are a really great way of doing it and Southpac runs a great learning teams course. Um, you're just observing the work being completed. You know, there's videos, there's records of field leadership if you've got a good field leadership program. And even previous incidents will give you an idea about what's happening out there in the workforce if something's constantly occurring. Um, just a couple of questioning te techniques. Be there. Don't be on your phone. Don't be distracted. Focus on the people. Ask those great questions. Be a human. Don't be a safety narc. No one likes safety police, right? If you want to learn about normal work, don't be asking about whether they've got a license or a permit or things like that. Be a human, don't be a safety narc. We talked about being curious before um, and just the basic sort of good questioning techniques. If you're not sure, summarize, you know, paraphrase, reflect on what they've said, um, you know, that, and that sort of thing. So, that, um, so how do we put it in normal work? I'm gonna run really quickly through this. How can you pump that, what things you've, that information you've learned from that investigation to normal work. How do you put that into an investigation? So um, at investigations differently, we have a, a three-tier timeline. Basically it's called work is done, work is intended, work is normal. Uh, and they pretty much speak for themselves. Um, so this is a very, this is a graphic way of describing. So imagine a three-tier timeline as you would across. Um, so work is intended, work is normal, work is done. So in this case, we've got someone using a hammer um, for the burst part of the job, then they use a box cutter, then they used a chainsaw, and then there was an event of some sort. We look at our procedures and it says we use a, uh, a hammer, but we use scissors. That's what the procedure says. But we, and we use a handsaw. So we can already see there's a couple of gaps in between workers intended and workers um, done. So that workers done is what happened at the event. Work is normal, so that's how those conversations we've gone ahead with all the crews and different shifts, night shift, day shift, and different teams, different sites, even if you've got the resources. That's use a hammer, but we all use a box cutter. So that's how it was done at the day, and that's how about our procedures are scissors. But we all use a handsaw, but this time we used a chainsaw. So what you want to do is plug that information into a sort of like a time flow, um, like a timeline. Um, and then you identify those gaps or those differences, right? So we can see there's two there. We've already pointed those out, the box cutter versus scissors and the chainsaw versus the uh, handsaw. And then we want to do is we want to find out the context surrounding the gaps. And it's not a five whys. I cannot stress enough, it's not a five whys. It's all about 
finding the conditions, the con restraints, the trade-offs, the resources. Now, you get a lot of this stuff from your workers normal when you went and talked to them, when, you, when they told you stories. You know, that's where you'll get a lot of this information from. You want to find out those issues, right? So don't be restrained by a five why. Some of it might be a why, and it's a question you might ask, but it's all about the messy story, right? Do this for each gap identified. So example there, no scissors, box cutter's more efficient, no PPE, task requirements are changed and so forth, right? So that might be that the reason why people use box cutters instead of scissors. It may be one of those, it may be all of them. Um, that's a sample of an Excel spreadsheet of how that would plug in. It's not actually for that, for that uh, little scenario there, but it's just an idea of, of that. And I, and, and I actually, on my website, if you go to my website, you can put in your details and um, download a copy of that Excel template if you like. Um, I just wanna make a quick point. This is the last slide before I wrap it up. Um, with typical root cause analysis using prepackaged investigation models like ICAM, Taproot, um, Central Factors, all those sort of ones where they get you to look in a book, what you're looking for is what you find. And Dave Proven, if you know him, he said that. So if we're looking in a book to find something, we're going to find it. That's what we'll find. The, you know, the, the problem with the Swiss cheese model, it only directs you to find the issues causing the event. So all those other holes in the cheese, it sort of gets you to ignore a bit, right? Depending upon how good the investigator is, but typically that's where most investigations get pointed. Um, they don't really talk about context or conditions of work or all those other things. They talk about work environment, but it doesn't really cover it very well. And in fact, James Reason himself, where it comes from, he discredited it as an investigation model uh, in 2006 with a paper um, that he wrote with uh, others. Um, he said it's a nice heuristic explanatory device, but as, a, as, a, as an investigation model, he actually discredited it. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, that's my website. If you go there, you'll be able to download that timeline tool if you're interested in it um, for free. Um, there's no, no, uh, no obligation there. And I guess the thing is, are there any questions, thoughts? Feel free. Yeah, I've, got, I've got a quick comment, Mark. Um, yep. So, uh, yeah, we had the same issue about, you know, all the uh, pre-cooked uh, methodologies drive you into that categorisation. So what we did, we actually added in uh, observations against um, conditions and then it allows us as a business to decide if we want to address those things that we surfaced um, when we built our uh, conditions in our event timelines. Um, yeah. And that's been, that's been quite effective. So it allows yep. that, that, that also a bit of, you know, uh, and the comment Larry made before about diversity in the team, we have a pretty structured review process for the bigger events. And one of the things we spend a lot of time on is getting diversity in that review. Excellent. Nice, Michael, well done. Um, Mark, we have people singing your praises in the chat. Um, so thank you. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. you for that. Throw money, uh, throw money, no. <laughs> <laughs> Bounce back to them. They're all on a, all on a monitor. Um, so what I'll do after this, guys, is I'll just send a follow-up email. So that's going to have a link to the recording um, and the, the Investigations Differently website and how you can get in contact with Mark. Um, we'll have a little opportunity for feedback as well. So um, this was new for us, running a workshop, and we're yeah. really looking to um, see what you thought of it and whether you, what you got out of it. Um, so please give us some feedback if you have the, the time. And I uh, just want to extend a huge thank you again to you, Mark. It was a right, you're welcome. And thank you all so much for participating as well. We so appreciate your time. Uh, we know it's usually lunchtime, so um, please go off and have your lunch. No worries. Thank you, everyone. And have a good, good uh, day and have a great weekend coming up. Keep safe. Cheers. Bye.